such an amazing group of people where we can share our praises, we can share our testimonies, we can share our worries and our doubts, and we feel safe here. So as an extension of worship, would you join with me as we recite Psalm 95 verses 1 to 7. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let us sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands formed the dry land too. Come, 
Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God. We are the people He watches over, the flock under His care. If only you would listen to His voice today. This is the word of our Lord. this morning. I know I need a lot of it. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Let's sing and thank the Lord for His amazing grace. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of love. shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings see this is amazing grace this is amazing grace this is a failing love that you would say
for your grace for a sinner like me God thank you so much that you love us with a love that we don't often deserve and you see through our faults to the very point of our need and we thank you for that Lord amen now's the time in our service where we open up our altar for praying uh, or prayer for healing or any other need that you may be carrying in here today. So our altar care team is going to take their place down front. And as we continue our time of worship, feel free to come down, have somebody meet you here, pray with you, help shoulder that burden with you. And uh, we'll take communion later in the service. But right now, we'll, we'll just have this time to pray and to continue in our time of worship.
singing along with us before I spoke a word before I spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me amen yes he has before I took the breath you breathed your life in me been so kind. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I could
Lord, we lean into you this morning. We thank you for the love and the grace and the provision and the help, the safety, all the good things that we've received from you. And Lord, for all the troubles that we see in our lives right now, the places in our lives that we don't know how we're gonna make it out of or make it through, Lord, we lean on you. And we recall the way that you've helped us in the past, and we claim that over the way you're helping us now and the way you will help us in the future. Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done in our lives. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for loving us. We worship you today. Help us to be open to receive from your word. Help us to be open to, to be different than when we walked in here. Let our lives be laid open before you, to be changed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to dismiss our kids, and we're excited that they get to go to another worship service. They get two worship services in one day. We're thankful for all of our children volunteers. Kids, you guys have fun. If, you're, if you have a kid in the service right now and you don't know where to go, you can follow these kids and go up one level, and there will be, you'll find somebody on the balcony level out that way that can help you find where you need to go. And for the rest of us, we're going to pass the peace. That means we're going to share with each other that we love them, and we're going to share the peace of Christ with them. Well, welcome. What a joy to gather together in worship, and what a wonderful service we've had so far and will continue to have. If you are visiting with us and you have never kind of filled out a connection card or let us know about your presence in our community, we invite you to grab a connection card in the pew rack in front of you. Fill it out. You can place it in the offering bag when it passes in a few moments, or you can take it to the guest connection station in the sanctuary for your after the service. If you're worshiping with us online, welcome as well. You are an important part of our community and our family. Please let us know how we can pray with you, serve you, love on you this week as well. Several things to just kind of bring to our attention that are happening in the life of our church over the next several weeks, beginning with lunch today. Does anybody know what's happening for lunch today? Hopefully, yes. Ruby knows. Are you headed there? Good. Well, y'all want to all, let's all have lunch with Bill and Ruby. They are headed upstairs to Montel Hardwick Hall after the service for a wonderful come to the table lunch sponsored by our Royal Rangers and our Girls Club to raise money for kids camp to make sure that every kid that wants to go to camp can come. And so they have prepared, they even gave me a, a, a smell of it. They didn't let me taste it, but they gave me a smell of it this morning. It's chicken tenderloins and pasta with marinara sauce and garlic bread and all that good stuff. So hopefully you'll make plans to come join us after the service for lunch today to support our children's ministry. Our sweet tea and easel paint night, the food theme continues right from last week. It's happening on, oh man, I don't have the date. When is that? July the 23rd. It's happening on July the 23rd. It's going to be a wonderful time. It's going to be 6.30 p.m. You can register at ccnash.org. Space is limited. And so this is one of those moments where there's a, a great artist that will kind of guide you through painting a painting. So don't worry if you're not an artist. It's for you as well. So please make plans to join us there. We also wanted to let you know that we are hiring day school teachers right now. Our day school is really ramping up to a new season of ministry. We have had a wonderful day school for so many years, and we've got a new leader, Candy Good, that we'll introduce you to in the coming weeks. And we are beginning this fall a new five-day program and full-time care. So it's a whole new thing for our day school. So it's going to require some additional 
teachers. So we have applications available in the foyer. If you, if you would like to be considered for that or you know someone who we ought to consider for that. My final announcement is a really special one, and I'm going to invite three special folks to come join me on stage. We had the generosity many years ago of several members of this church beginning a scholarship fund to honor two of our beloved members who passed away years ago but loved education and loved learning and loved school. That was Emmy Scott and Eric Falk. And so there is a scholarship fund named in their honor that each year we get to make awards from to people in college, some of our students in college that are either headed to college or, or are already in college, to just honor them and honor Eric and Emmy and promote education and promote the great students in our church. And so I want to introduce you to this year's recipients of the Eric and Emmy Scholarship. We have John Carpenter, Jenny Crawford, and Rachel Hill up here with me today. And so we've also got one more recipient, Chelston Wilden, that just wasn't able to be with us today. So we honor Chelston as well. And so just really quickly, tell us where you're going to school. Just kind of let us know so we remember. I'm going to UTC in Chattanooga. Awesome. Nashville State. Awesome. Lee University. Awesome. Uh-oh. I know there's always a Lee contingency. Well, we are so glad. So can we just honor our Eric and Emmy scholars one more time? And as we prepare to continue in worship through giving of our tithes and our offerings, let me share with you a testimony about one of the new groups that has begun among us. This past spring, a new community for widows and widowers began here at Christ Church called Hope Beyond Loss. It began with a luncheon hosted by a few deacons and volunteers who felt that there was a need for a supportive community among those who had suffered the loss of their spouse. The response was overwhelming. There was a large turnout confirming what had been placed on their hearts to do. The testimonies of people sharing stories, praying with one another, and connecting through their common experience has been profound. Space was created around a meal to encourage and to grieve with one another and to form new friendships. And so this is a wonderful, wonderful community that's begun. And if you are interested in participating in this community, they're hosting a game night coming up Saturday, June 30th, this coming Saturday at 6 p.m. in room 103. So if you would like more information about that, you can email the church and we'll get you information. But consider jumping into their game night. It's a wonderful community of caring and loving individuals. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all of the life that is represented in these announcements, Lord. We thank you for these students, God. We pray blessing over them in their studies that you will increase them in wisdom and growth and maturity and learning that they could lead all of us and teach all of us. Lord, we thank you for this new community group, God. What a blessing. We pray that it will reach beyond what the leaders could have expected or thought or asked for. And we pray over these gifts that your faithful people are about to give, that these would be gifts of joy and gifts of blessing to this community and beyond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give.
trust in you, I will put my trust in you. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I will trust. I'll trust in you. I will trust. Would you please stand today as we read our scripture reading for this morning, for our sermon, found in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 33 through 41. And you can just follow with me with the words on the screen. And with many parables, he, speaking of Jesus, spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him alone in a boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose. And the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was asleep. I'm sorry. He was in. I want him to sleep already. Uh, he was in the stern, 
asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. God bless you. You can be seated. Um, So, good morning. Before I preach, before I share the message with you, you guys just mess me up. I mean, in a good way. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you. Wow. So if you have not noticed the thread that has been running through our time together this morning, I'm going to be preaching today about learning to trust God. And so I want to both encourage you and for some, I pray that this message will in some way set us free. So there are many scriptures in the Bible that talk about trusting God and trusting others. Uh, The lectionary readings for today, they all kind of revolve around the theme of trust. Some of the stories that are in those readings are the story of David versus Goliath and the story of Job dealing with his troubles and the story of the early church as they were challenged Uh, to spread the gospel and all that they went through. Each person in these individual stories all had to trust God in order to find victory in their situation. But I'm checking my pants leg because (laughs) I know Pastor Hunter will help me out. But But thank you, Hunter, Pastor Hunter. Uh, But what does it mean to trust? The Hebrew meaning of this word means to rely upon or to cling to. Trust, by its very nature, points us to relationship. And in a relationship, you and I, we have to put our hope or trust, whatever word works for you, we have to put our hope and our trust, our faith in the ability and the goodwill of someone else, which means that we really don't have complete control over the relationship. But every good relationship, every good relationship is built upon the foundation of trust. And when trust is in question or when trust is broken, there is the great possibility that that relationship may fail. In chapter 4 of Mark's gospel, we find Jesus teaching the crowds about the kingdom of God, and he is explaining the kingdom, uh, what it's like, what happens in the kingdom, what God is like by using parables, the scripture tells us. Now, parables are these wonderful little stories that Jesus would use to illustrate or to explain a spiritual principle or concept. Uh, My middle child is working the cameras, and before service, she told me, don't move a whole lot. (laughs) So I'll try, Dominique. I'll try. So parables are these stories that Jesus would use to teach a or explain a spiritual principle or concept. In this particular chapter of Mark's gospel, Jesus uh, talks about a man who is sowing seed and You may be familiar with the story. Some fall by the wayside, and some fall on stony ground, and some on thorny ground, but some fall on good ground. He also talks about in this uh, particular chapter that we are to use a lamp and put it in its proper place, not under a basket, but on a lampstand. And then also in the same chapter, as Jesus is telling these parables, he tells the parable of the mustard seed. He talks about how even though it's the smallest, uh, one of the smallest seeds, it has the potential inside to become one of the 
biggest plans. He's trying to explain what the kingdom is like through these parables. But many times the Bible tells us, maybe most times, the people still couldn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Even though his parables were simple and relevant, they couldn't understand the meaning of those parables, even the disciples. But the Bible tells us that many times after the crowd would leave, Jesus would come to the disciples and explain to them the meaning of the parable. But the question that we have to ask is, why did he do that? Why didn't he just take time to explain it fully to everyone and not just his disciples? The answer is found in this same chapter in verse 11, when Jesus tells his disciples, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. I want you to listen to that. Jesus told his disciples, to you, it has been given to know the mysteries of God. For a long time, it took for that to sink down in me. Even when I was preaching, I had started um, preaching. I, I really didn't wrap my theology around this concept that God is not trying to hide things from me. It's quite the opposite. God is trying to reveal his mysteries to us. And so when we think about God revealing what is sometimes hidden, we can understand what Jesus says in John chapter 15. John 15 verse 15, Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. And for all the things that I heard from the Father, I have made those things known to you. I heard this wonderful quote by uh, Dr. A.R. Bernard. He, te he preaches and pastors a wonderful church in Brooklyn. And he said that our faith is a reasoned faith. Our faith is not a blind faith. Many times we think faith requires for us just to step out on nothing. But that's not what the writer of Hebrews tells us. It tells us that faith has substance, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And why is that? Because God is in the business of revealing himself, not hiding himself. He calls us friends, and friendship requires trust. And trusting God requires transparency. And so when Jesus called his disciples in the Gospels to follow him, he also said, come and see. He invited them to see both his public and his private life. How many want to sign up for that? For people to see both your public when you're in church like this all dressed up and your private when you're at home doing what you do at home. Who wants to show everyone that? But in discipleship, we are invited to come and see, to be in relationship with God. So here's the question, at least one. How's your relationship with God? If you were truly transparent, like a good relationship should be, how good, how strong, how bad is your relationship, not our relationship, but your relationship personally with God? Has he been truly honest and transparent with you in his relationship, in this relationship? And have you been truly honest and transparent with him? The disciples lived with Jesus for almost three years. They heard the sermons. They saw the miracles. They even received the one-on-one -on -one teaching of what the parables meant. But with all of that, there was still something missing. Henry Blackaby, in his book, Experiencing God, makes this quote. There is a world of difference between knowing something to be true in your head and experiencing the reality in your life. Isn't that good? That's a whole wide chasm in between what you know and what you really know. When I was uh, growing up, I'll give you an illustration. My parents and other adults who loved me 
were always telling me what to do and not to do in life. Right? Now, they were telling me those things not to try to run my life, but they loved me. They loved me. And they didn't want me to make the same mistakes or deal with the same hardships that maybe they experienced in their own lives. But like every wet behind the ear teenager and young adult, most of what they said kind of went in and came out. Why? Because I had to learn it for myself. Let me figure it out. I hear you. I I love you. But I want to live my life. I want to do what I want to do. I wanted to not listen to the advice, but experience it for myself. And some lessons in life are best learned through personal experience. And learning to trust God is just like that. In the Bible, there are two stories about the disciples being in a storm. In one story, the disciples are in a boat and Jesus is not with them. And as the storm is about to take them under, they're afraid, they're worried. They see Jesus coming towards them, walking on the water. That's one story. But in our story today, they are in a boat and Jesus is in the boat with them, but he's sleeping. Now in both stories, the one where he walks on the water and the one that he is sleeping in the boat, we learn something about Jesus and we learn something about ourselves. So let's walk through the text this morning. Let's walk through the scripture, Mark chapter four. Let's look at verse five. It says, on the same day when evening had come, He, speaking of Jesus, said to them, let's go over, let's cross over to the other side. The same day. What day? The day that he had spent teaching these parables about the sower of the seed, about the mustard seed. Jesus, in the evening, told the disciples, get up, pack up, and let's go. Why is it that Jesus is never satisfied when things are good? Why is it that he's always trying to get us to change, to go, to explore vast new worlds, right? Star Trek. Yeah. Vast new worlds. But he tells them to go. But the question is why? In this particular passage of scripture, what's on the other side? Why do I have to change my life to go to the other side? Life is good on this side. If you were to continue reading in chapter 5, There were some awesome things that he does on the other side. On the other side was the demon-possessed man who had this legion in him that Jesus cast out into the swine. On the other side was the woman who had the issue of blood. There was a lot going on on the other side. And sometimes when Jesus asks us to go somewhere or to change something, it's not about us. Sometimes it's all about someone else. And is it inconvenient when God wants you to travel with him to help someone else? Absolutely it is. Let's look a little bit further. So they have Jesus on the boat. They're starting to go to the other side. And then verse 36 tells us that there were other little boats with them. Who's following you? Who's jumping in their boat when you jump in your boat? And so when they decided to obey Jesus, it influenced others to obey Jesus, even though he didn't give the personal call to obey to them. They followed because the disciples obeyed. Where is your influence today? Maybe as a parent or a boss on the job, or maybe it's a, 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 a school teacher in a classroom. What is your influence? What is that doing on other people? Let's look a little bit further. Verse 37, as Jesus' boat and the other little boats are making their way to the other side because Jesus has an appointment, he has to meet some people on the other side. As they are going, the scripture tells us, I'm trying to not walk too much, Dominique. Uh, the scripture tells us, that a great windstorm rose up. 
Now, isn't it funny that earlier that same day, Jesus was standing on that boat preaching the gospel? Because there were so many people, and it was his custom from time to time to get a little room away from the people so they could see him and hear him, so his voice could project. So earlier in the day, the boat was being used as a tool for the gospel. And now that same boat is bringing them in probably one of the biggest storms that some of the fishermen who were the disciples had ever been in. Isn't it amazing that one, what once was a blessing is, not, is now a burden? Isn't it interesting sometimes how we lose sight that what we are, are blessed with is still a blessing? The same boat that Jesus preached in earlier in the day is the boat that's carrying them into the storm. And life is like that. Everything's fine in the morning. And by the time evening comes, all hell has broken loose. On the same day, what has changed? You're still the same person. He's still the same God. But what used to be a blessed day is now a hard day. And so storms, what this scripture teaches us, is that storms will come even when you obey God and even when you are right in the middle of God's will. And sometimes we mistake being in God's will because we have all of, all of this stuff coming against us. But sometimes you can be exactly where God wants you to be, but it doesn't look like it and it certainly doesn't feel like it. So we're talking about learning to trust God. How did the disciples respond to the storm? We do have that story written down for us. They didn't get an A on this particular day. But the better question is, how do you respond when your storms show up? Because it's easy to critique the disciples because we have their story. We know the end of the story. But let's critique ourselves. When storms come on the same day that blessings showed up, how do we respond? Do we trust God then like we trust him when the sun was shining? Blackaby makes another quote in the same book. He says, when we face a crisis of belief, what you do next reveals what you really believe about God. It's not when the sun is out and you've got a cool breeze and every, the, 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 the wind is, is behind your sail. The wind is just blowing you to tropical islands. That's not when the proof is really in the pudding, right? Blackaby says it's when you are facing a crisis of belief that it's what you do next that reveals what you believe about God. This is a very personal um, sermon for me today because I've got some drama going on in my extended family. Drama and family. Those two don't go together, do they? <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've, I have friends that are really facing it right now. So I've got my family and I have friends. And because I'm a pastor, I kind of hear some of the drama going on in my church family. And I'm like, God, this is just too much. Where is this windstorm coming from? You know, when we prepare lessons and sermons as preachers and teachers, you know, sometimes it can be very academic. It can be very kind of routine. You know, you, you get your notes and you study your commentaries and you pray. You know, you do all of those things. But I'm telling you, it wasn't until all that junk started happening that this sermon really became real. Because some lessons you can only learn through personal experience. And so, when life gets hard, what do you believe about God? I'm not talking about when, the day you got saved. I'm talking about right now when everything's hitting the fan. What do you believe about God when it's hard to believe anything about God? And so they are in this storm. Jesus is in the boat, but he is in the back of the boat with his head on a pillow, and he's sleeping. This is one of the most curious scriptures about Jesus for me in the Gospels. 
Because normally it's the disciples who fall asleep on Jesus, right? <laughs> but the, you know, the script is flipped and Jesus is snoozing, dozing, snoring maybe while all of this is going on. What is wrong with Jesus? Maybe the scripture is just telling us or giving us a, a clue that Jesus was a heavy sleeper. You know, I've been known to sleep through storms around the house, come out limbs all over the yard because sometimes I can be a heavy sleeper. Was Jesus just not aware of the problem or did he had some type of strong belief that no matter what was going to come against him or his disciples, that God was going to handle it? Or maybe he just had a lot of confidence in himself. Of course, he's the son of God. So if something bad were to come up, you know, he could, he could do what he needed to do. Or maybe, maybe there was a little ounce of confidence that he had in the disciples. I remember when my kids started, started driving. I mean, you know, for any parent or adult who has, you know, trained a, a, a a teenager to drive, it's a little nerve wracking, right? And you could not have paid me to close my eyes, let alone go to sleep <laughs> when my kids were learning to drive. But something funny happened. After driving for a while, when they would take us somewhere, because we would give them the keys, you drive, I found myself closing my eyes, if it was a long trip, going to sleep. What was the difference? Same child, same car, but there was some confidence that I had in my kids now, even though they may not have seen the potential in themselves, they had proven it to me. Jesus, don't you care? That was the next thing they said. They came and woke Jesus up out of his sleep and said, Master, don't you care that we are perishing? You know, when life gets hard, questions are not easily answered. You know, this kind of like God is good all the time stuff, that's good when we're sitting in here. But when your life is on the line, or at least you think your life is on the line, that's not enough. So the question is, did they know Jesus cared for them? Yes, they knew Jesus cared for them. Of course they knew Jesus cared for them. They wouldn't have given up their careers and businesses to follow him if they didn't think. You wouldn't do it unless you're stupid, right? And I'm not calling anyone stupid, but I'm trying to say, did they trust Jesus even though they asked this question? Yes, they knew Jesus cared for them. But when you are in a storm and your life is on the line and he's sleeping, you just need to be reassured that he cares. I may be speaking to someone today who really loves God and God really loves you, but right now you're facing it, you're up against the wall and you're not sure if he's paying attention because you're praying and you're not hearing anything back. You're asking and you're not receiving. You know that he loves you. You know that he cares. But right now, does he really care when I'm in a hardship? Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, when Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids them to come and die. <laughs> That's discipleship. Now, the preacher didn't tell you that when he says, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. But when we come to Jesus... It's not just the miracles that he asks us to be a part of, but it's a cross that he wants us to bear as well. He tells us to take up our cross daily and follow him. But when we do that, there's pain involved with the cross. There's pain involved with following him all the way. And when pain comes, do we have an answer to the question, does God care for me? And if so, why isn't he doing something? So Jesus wakes up, and the Bible says that he doesn't rebuke the disciples, not yet. He doesn't get on their case, not yet. He wakes up, sees the storm, and he begins to deal with the storm. 
And what does he say? Jesus says, peace, comma, be still. I love the grammar in that because you can't have the stillness until the peace shows up. Things are just, I mean, just going and going and coming. I mean, you're getting hit on the left. <laughs> That's so funny. I was pointing to my right, sorry. You, you get hit, hit on your left, and by the time your face comes around to the right, you get hit on the right. I mean, you can't catch a break. You, you barely can get your head above water to, to get a breath. And so Jesus, when he addresses the problem that the disciples were having, i.e. the storm, he says, peace. And that word peace is so simple. The actual meaning of that word in the Greek is silence. And there's another word that they give in that definition of the word peace. And it's, it's like, really? It means hush. So if you can kind of visualize this, Jesus wakes up. The disciples are just out of their minds scared. Jesus sees the storm water all in the boat, and he says, hush. Now, we know he was speaking to the wind and the waves, but maybe he was also speaking to the disciples, kind of on the side, right? Hush, I can't concentrate. I can't, I can't deal with this with all this noise around me. Hush. And he says, peace, be still. And the Bible tells us that the wind stopped, the waves were like glass, smooth. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, why are you so afraid? Why are you fearful? Why are you filled full of fear? Where is your faith? When we look at this text today, and Jesus is addressing the disciples, he fixes the problem, but the problem wasn't the problem. So he speaks to the problem. And he says, why did you respond that way? Why did this situation cause you to respond that way? Why are you so fearful in this situation, but you have faith in other situations? How is it, Jesus asked the disciples, that you have no faith? Today, I was sharing with the pastors this week when we were in the worship team this week about how I saw the sermon going. I told them that I wanted to have a moment where we come to Jesus, a come to Jesus moment, because I need it, so I'm going to invite you to be a part of it. Um... Some in this room, if not all, you are facing, I mean, a big storm. It could be your health, some relational issue, financial issue. I don't know what it is. And somebody may look at it and say, oh, that's not bad at all. But to you, it has you on the ropes. And yes, you love God. And yes, you believe God. And but right now, it just seems as though, Lord, don't you care that I'm dying out here? My heart is broken. I don't know what to do. And I need you now, but you seem like you are sleeping. If you have a storm that you're going through now, I'm not going to ask you to stand up or look beside you and tell the person your storm because we don't need to know that. But you need to know, and you need to identify it as a storm. And I believe that today, for me, because it's personal for me, and for those that are facing a storm right now, maybe it's not directly a personal, meaning that it's your stuff, but it maybe it's a child or, you know, a family member or a loved one or, you know. I want you today, just where you are, if you need God to deliver you from your storm, I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. Now, 
Thank you for standing. Now, there's some, some people in here, and I'm not going to force anyone to stand. But you're sitting in your seat, and you know that this sermon is for you, but you're a little bit afraid of kind of what eyes are going to be looking at you. Who cares about that? If the Lord is present to deliver and to strengthen you, don't you want that? And those that stood are like the ones who are in the boat and they're saying, come on, get in the boat with me. Let's all go to the other side. So we're going to pray right now. And whatever those storms are, I want you, however it works for you in your heart or just in your mind or if there needs to be some type of action that you do that helps you to connect those things that we're praying about, we're going to give those things to God because he is the only one that can solve it, that can fix it, that can change it, that can bring us out. So, Father, we stand in your presence in front of our brothers and sisters admitting that we have a storm that we can't find our way out of. And so, God, we come to the only one who is able to speak peace into our situation, and that is you. So I pray that whatever those storms are that are represented by my brothers and sisters who are standing, let them know, let us know that you are still with us. You have made promises to us that we haven't seen come to pass yet, but your promises are true. We have planted seed in the ground in so many different ways, and we haven't seen that seed bear any fruit yet. But we know that you are the one who brings the increase. We are out here on this boat of our storm, and God, we don't know how we're going to make it. But we know the one who can bring us through it. And so, God, we take our hands off of our problems. We have ran into that wall long enough trying to fix it ourselves. And we release it to you. Take our storms and speak peace into them now, Father. And where there has been fear, may your overwhelming love cast that fear out. Do you care for us? Yes, you do. You more than care. You love us. And so today, we learn to trust you with our storms. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In a moment, Pastor Sean and Pastor Linda are coming and we're going to partake in communion. I need it just like you need it. And so would you please, whether you stood or you remain seated, during that time of prayer. Let's bring it all to the altar today, all to the table. May we all stand together. This has been a beautiful service today. We've worshiped. We've heard to trust our God. Even in our times of trouble, he is there with us. I can't think of a better way for us to come to end our service today of being together as family, as to come to the table of the Lord together to take communion. And we say this each and every time, this is not the table of Christ's church. This is the table of the Lord. And all are welcome. And we all participate together if we're God's people, right? 
Amen. So we always start with our Apostles' Creed, so let's read together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we come preparing our hearts by asking God to forgive us for the things that we have done and for the things that we have left undone. And we do this by reading and reciting the prayer of contrition together. So let's read this together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Father God, have mercy on us and forgive us through you, our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all of your goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us walking in, his, in your eternal and abundant life. Amen. We invite you to take a seat and our service will serve you. Wait until everyone is served and we will take communion together. to this message in this song. When I cannot hear the sparrow sing, when I cannot feel the melody, there's a secret place that's full
Hopefully, Christopher's going to help us sing the Our Father, because it's left up to me. You'll be distracted um, that I'm not Pastor Dan. <laughs> Great segue. Yes, awesome. My bad. <laughs> I like that song. I got carried away. I like this song, too. This is good. Our Father, which art in the Lord is present among us. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink and of new and unending life in him. And Lord, sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament 
and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And everyone said, Amen. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do this for the remembrance of me. As we go from here today and reflect on the sermon and reflect on the theme of this service, I think this is an appropriate prayer for us. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your God. One more time. Let us become more aware of your presence. In our lives this week, Lord. Let us experience the glory even in the middle of the storm, there's goodness and you are present. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you in the middle of the storm. May he cause his face to shine down upon you as you walk through the storm. May he be gracious to each of you and give you his peace which surpasses all understanding until the storm is over. May we leave here in this peace and serve the Lord. May God richly bless you.